What's up, guys? How you doing? This is Micah Dobbins, host of The Micah Dobbins Show. And today we're going to be talking about how to build generational wealth. So as many of you already know, there has been a lot of economic uncertainty going on right now. And with so much in the media about job loss and needing to boost the economy, as well as stories that you may have seen telling you how people have seemed to get rich overnight through apps like Robinhood and all these things, I thought it would be um, adequate to do a show in particular about building generational wealth and help you to kind of better understand some of these economic principles in life today. There's a scripture, and I'm going to start here because I think it's very vital that we have this understanding. But the scripture basically says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And that's Proverbs 13, 22. And what it's saying is that a good man will leave um, an inheritance, not only for his immediate children, but also for his grandchildren. And I want you guys to think about that for a minute. When we talk about generational wealth and we talk about handing things down, right now we're currently in a time where a lot of people are upset at those who are considered trust fund babies. They feel like, well, you know, your life is great. Your parents were rich. They left you set up. So, you know, the, the, the deck is stacked against me somehow. And because of your success or because of all that your family is able to obtain, you're somehow in this class or hated group. So I wanted to kind of help educate us and maybe reform some of the ways we think about um, economics uh, for those who are watching the show and maybe give you some insight or some advice on how to not only better your personal situation, but how to take care of your children and your children's children, looking out for your grandchildren, which would be a good thing to do. So before we get into it, guys, I want to give you guys a little bit of insight um, of where we are right now during this current pandemic and our economic crisis. If you look at the statistics, according to the bestschools.org, the arts and entertainment and recreational industries took um, a hit of 18 percent um, on a decline. Uh, leisure and hospitality took a hit of 16 percent and accommodation and food services likewise took a hit of 16 percent. So all of these businesses are on a decline right now. And there are five industries that they've listed that they consider to be pandemic proof that they consider to be, you know, jobs or industries that you can work in regardless of what everything around you is doing. You'll still be able to find work. And I'm going to list those five just starting out just to kind of give you food for thought. If you're already in the right field or if maybe you need to change your career goals. Afterwards, though, we're going to break down how to build generational wealth and really talk about this thing in depth and maybe even share a little bit of um, Dave Ramsey wisdom in there on his seven baby steps to get you through the process. So uh, the top five pandemic proof industries uh, they have listed is information technology, IT work. Obviously the tech sector has, you know, done better than most others during the pandemic um, with people now having to work online because they're quarantined at home, working from home. IT work has exploded um, and the tech industries have really grown in large, even down to the extent where people ordering things online and working. Um, the IT field is definitely pandemic proof and continuing to grow. So if you're in that field or considering that field, um, your mind might be in the right place to help your wallets later. Uh, another one is, you know, federal government jobs. Obviously, working for the feds. Um, has several other benefits as well. There are some federal jobs where you can get like a 20 year retirement so you can retire early. But for the most part, um, there are a lot of federal jobs that um, are good right now that you could be doing uh, that has continued uh, to thrive despite the pandemic. It said the federal government stepped up its hiring in 2020 to support many of its responses to the COVID-19. 
And although some are temporary positions, many offer competitive salaries with possible job extensions. So you could become permanent. And there's been a 9.75 um, increase in government jobs over the past year. So right now, you know, there is a lot of growth within the federal government, which is another um, industry that you may want to consider working in that is pandemic proof. Um, other ones they listed were insurance. Job growth in the financial and insurance sector really shouldn't be much of a surprise um, when you look at what's going on with the pandemic right now. If somebody gets hospitalized and they're in need of a ventilator, the bill is going to get really expensive. And as a result, the customers are investing in insurance to protect themselves from costly COVID-19 coverage. So right now, a lot of those companies are having growth because people, um, you know, they, they're going to need insurance, obviously, for this. Uh, another industry that's considered pandemic proof is scientific research and development. And I know some of you are saying, man, Micah, these are some really tough jobs or some tough industries to get into, but don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you five industries that are growing right now, despite that. And you can consider it scientific research and development. If you're already in that field, or already in that area of study. And when I say that, I mean like microbiologists, um, biological technicians, um, you know, aerospace engineers, these type of jobs right now are in high demand in other research because people are um, needing to get more information scientifically as it pertains to the pandemic and other things. Research and development uh, is, a, is, a, is a serious industry. If you, if you could get into it, I suggest you stick with it or you try to make some things shake in that industry because it is considered to be um, pandemic proof. Another one is real estate. Real estate um, has thrived right now during this whole COVID-19 recession. Um, you know, the whole stay-at-home culture, that has been born um, because of this coronavirus pandemic has led to increased demand uh, for new and, and for um, used existing homes right now. So right now, this industry um, saw like a small um, job loss. But right now, a lot of people are searching. If you're in the Atlanta area, you know this to be true. I can't tell you the amount of letters that my wife and I get in the mail from people saying, hey, we want to buy your home, want to buy your home, want to buy your home. And they're offering uh, more and more uh, value to the neighborhood as a lot of people are trying to come out here. So if you're looking to be like a real estate agent, a real estate broker, property, real estate, community association manager, all of these would be um, good positions to consider right now during this pandemic and uh, during our upcoming you know, job recession. So I wanted to kind of go over those five industries that they consider to be pandemic proof. And maybe um, you could consider one of those as we talk about preparation for building uh, generational wealth or how to build generational wealth. Now, before we get into the generational wealth, I want to recommend something to you guys. And I know right now there's a lot of flack and a lot of talk about um, Dave Ramsey's in reference to an interview he gave on Fox the other day where he was speaking about uh, the stimulus. And a lot of people have been, you know, taking him to task through the Twitterverse and all these things. And that's fine. Um, what I want to point out, though, is that before this whole mess went down. There were seven baby steps that Dave Ramsey's recommended. And these seven baby steps, I've read the book actually, you know, total, total money makeover. And if you, if you get a chance, I might even put a link in the description for you to get the book. It is a life-changing book uh, as it pertains to the information and how you look at um, money and finances. Uh, I like Dave's approach in the book. Because uh, and even some of his lectures that I've seen online, I've never seen him live, but some of his lectures online, I can really appreciate. And I've applied some of the principles that Dave Ramsey um, recommended years ago before I started my own business. I applied a lot of those principles as far as like paying off debt and doing these things and and, and recognizing the, the, the credit industry for what it is and some of the predatory lending practices that are there. So. Dave had a lot to offer, and I would recommend um, you guys check out those seven baby steps. I'm going to kind of read them to you now so that if you are considering building generational wealth, this is a good philosophy to kind of build upon. And um, there's also another book called The Richest Man in Babylon that we had to read in college that also was pretty good. But I want to touch on this. Baby step number one, according to um, the Dave Ramsey's seven baby step plan, is to save $1,000 um, for a starter emergency fund. 
And basically, Dave is saying, you know, you need to get $1,000 and get it to where you can't touch it. Um, if you got to put it in a bank account where you don't have access to the cards, you're going to get the money by going in person. If you can, you know, put it away, lock it away somewhere to where you can't just easily get to it. Uh, he makes a reference of don't make it your pizza money. You know, when somebody just goes in the drawer to pay for a pizza right quick or the delivery guy and give him a tip. But you want to make sure it's hard to get to this $1,000. And he says, do it in 30 days. And they say this is the first baby step, and it's the easiest baby step, or the first baby step, rather, the smallest, but it's also the hardest because most people don't have discipline when it comes to finances. And you can't build generational wealth until you develop um, disciplines with money. So the first step is to save $1,000. And after you save $1,000, um, baby step number two is to pay off all of your debt except your home using what's called a uh, debt snowball. And like I said, you can, you can get more insight and in, in more from this if you actually go to his site and, and listen to the lecture. I'm just going to give you guys a little touch. Um, when it comes to like the debt snowball, basically you look at all of your debt that you owe and you negotiate with each of your debtors to a balance that they'll accept as far as um, a minimal amount of payments that you can make. And you make those payments on each one. And when you pay the smallest off, so say if you're paying 35 on one, you're paying 50 on another, you're paying 100 on another, and you know so on. Once you paid off that $35 debt, rather than say, oh man, that's extra money now, my paycheck coming to me, take that same 35 and put it on the $50 debt. So now you're paying like what, $85 on that debt. And when you pay that $85 on that debt and that's paid off, add that $85 now to your $100 debt. So now instead of just paying $100 a month, you're putting all of those other payments that you paid off on that one. And it creates a snowball. It gets bigger and bigger until you're completely out of debt. And I think that's a pretty smart way, a savvy way uh, to help you economically. Uh, the third baby step that Dave Ramsey recommends after that is to save three to six months of expenses for a fully funded emergency fund. And some of us have heard this before, that you know, you might lose your job, you might get sick, uh, your company could go under, and you wanna have like three to six months expenses to cover you while you figure out what you wanna do. What a lot of people do, they actually rely on their 401k as their three to six month plan. They say, hey, listen, I don't have three to six months, but I just take my 401k and I use that when I leave this job. But your 401k is really your 401k. That's for your retirement, you know. And, and don't worry, I, I'm guilty of it. I've done it before. I'm not saying uh, that I haven't made some of these mistakes. This is why I'm able to tell you guys and educate you guys about it. But I wanted to share with you that the three to six month expense plan is really a good way to go um, to help secure your financial future and to help prepare you as you try to build generational wealth. Baby step number four, Invest 15% of your household income in retirement. So now at this point, you have, you know, your emergency fund really good and ready. Um, you paid off all your debt, but your home. So now you're going to start investing in retirement. And this, guys, is really important because a lot of people don't have a plan for retirement. They don't realize how serious retirement is. And one of the things I like about this method with the total uh, money makeover or Financial Peace University, one of the things they show you is the idea of compound interest and how important it is for you to put your money in um, accounts that pay you compound interest so that you can get more bang for your buck. And it's very important. So yes, that's step number four. Step number five is to save for your children's college fund. We're talking about building um, generational wealth. Um, and when you're talking about college and children, it could be really expensive. And that is a big debt that many Americans struggle with. Even now, uh, you might have heard this new Biden administration talking about, um, you know, wanting to pay off student debt. It's kind of a, a big issue in America right now where people are are in a lot of debt um, to colleges and universities. And some of these universities that, you know, aren't, you know, even fully, you know, recognized uh, as far as their accreditation and things, they're making all kind of promises to people if they just go ahead and, and, and sign up and it's free money. You know, we'll go to Fannie Mae, or Sally Mae and Fannie Mac and take care of you. And then you end up owing like mountains of debt at the end. So, you know, he, he recommends you save for your children's college fund so that you can help them escape from that pitfall and set them up. 
Baby step number six is to pay off your home early. So you've already taken care of all your other debts. Everything else is covered. So now you want to focus your money on paying your home off. And the quicker you pay your home off, the quicker you move to step seven, which is build wealth and give. Now you don't have a mortgage. You don't have a car note. You don't have any credit card outstanding debts. So now everything you earn is yours and you want to take it to build other wealth and you want to give. You want to actually become very generous in your giving and help people. And you're able to write a lot of these things off. And there are many other benefits to being um, a dynamic giver. So I wanted to share those seven baby steps uh, from the Financial Peace University by Dave Ramsey's to kind of give you an idea uh, of one of the things you need to be mentally prepared for before you can enter into building generational wealth, which is what we're going to get into now. Um, when you talk about generational wealth, is basically wealth that's passed down from one generation to another. It can also be called family wealth or legacy wealth. And if you're able to leave something behind for your children and for your grandchildren, then you're contributing to the growth of generational wealth in your family. And this is taken from clevergirlfinance.com, a blog writer by the name of Sarah. I'm really impressed with and hoping to have her on the show. But right now, we're going to kind of discuss about building generational wealth and how important it is. And I was really intrigued at some of the information that she was able to put out there because I was already you know, on a search for some of these things. I've already been studying these things. Being a father of six children, I find it vital and important um, to make sure that your children are well sought after. And with my wife homeschooling and, and me being the primary breadwinner, I mean, yeah, they do other businesses in the home and we're actually growing a lot of them lately, some newer ventures we're doing. But before, pretty much most of um, the income, most of everything that we had as far as a mortgage, car, et cetera, has been, you know, I've been bearing the brunt of it. It's been on my shoulders and it's not a complaint at all. I'm, I'm, I thank God to be able to do it. Uh, I believe it's in, in order uh, for a man to provide for his family. But I couldn't help but wonder like what things I could do to solidify their future, to make life better for them than maybe I had it. I remember growing up and I, I'm not saying I had a bad childhood, but my father used to tell me that, you know, growing up, he wanted to outdo his mother and his father and his father was a staff sergeant his mother had um earned her degree to be a school teacher i believe she may have had like an associates um maybe possibly even a bachelor's but my father went on to outperform um his parents that was a goal he had in life so while his father was in the army as a staff sergeant uh, my father was able to retire a major in the army and he was able to not only get his bachelor's but um, actually got his master's degree. Um, therefore, you know, moving himself up to a higher income potential, um, moving himself to more opportunity than his parents had had, and hoping to motivate me and my other six siblings to do the same. <laughs> now, mind you, this can horribly backfire uh, because some kids are like, yo, I'm not trying to outdo y'all. Like, that's just too much. And I remember that, feeling that weight, like when he would say that, like, you're a major, what am I going to become? Like a colonel, a general, like get out of here, you know? So these kind of things can um, hinder your children. So you don't want to put that kind of a pressure maybe, but you do want to express to them the importance and the understanding of a dollar in finance. And you want to teach them the importance and the understanding of um, taking care of the family, taking care of the debt, making sure that your name is good because, it affects so many other areas in life. And this is not to beat people up. Um, trust me, I've made more mistakes than a little bit. I've been in positions where um, you may have had to go to places that to, 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 to borrow money and things. And the interest rates is way higher than what it's supposed to be. Uh, I remember looking back at a vehicle we paid off. But I remember looking back when we initially bought the vehicle many years later after paying it off and looking at the percentage rate and seeing it in the double digits and how high in the double digits that we paid for this vehicle and recognizing how much money that we spent for having um, bad credit, 
I realized then that, okay, this is serious. It's time to make some serious lifestyle changes. Um, and I started to kind of learn the value of home ownership. Uh, we were able to buy a home early. So a lot of people would call and say, hey, we'll give you a check right now for $10,000. Just come pick it up. Let us run your credit. And if everything's good, because you're a homeowner, you're not a renter, and your your house um, is now somehow you know considered in, in, in your spending and, and how much you're making and how long you've been on your job. Uh, a lot of people don't even realize even their credit um, affects their bills, you know, um, your car insurance and many other things. And whether you pay late or on time, all of these things are tied in. So again, this is not to make you feel bad or to beat you up, but we're talking about how to build generational wealth. And you can't build generational wealth until you develop financial literacy and financial responsibility. And this is very important, guys. You have to wake up and say, okay, the free ride is over. The party is over. I'm done just living in the moment. I'm done doing paycheck to paycheck. I'm done saying, hey, Friday I get paid. I'm partying Saturday. I'm crying and praying about it in church on Sunday. And by Tuesday, I'm at lunch kind of hungry because I don't have enough to pay for everything and how I'm going to pay my car note and my bill. We want to break those kind of cycles. We want to break away from those kind of behavior patterns. And a lot of this is behavior. It's a matter of behavior modification. It's a matter of learning what to do. I do recall um, early on, my father used to tell me this when I when I got my first job. He said, you know, uh, Micah, you, you got your first job now. You want to be blessed? Uh, give 10% to tithe, put 10% in savings, and live off of the other 80. And then later on, I, I, I started to read on my own and hear other people talk about different philosophies, like a 2020, you know, these different ways uh, are 70, 30, how you can live off of your money. But you got to kind of find what works best for you and stick to it. So if you find that, you know, saving 10% is great. If, it's, if they say, you know, that's not enough. I need to save like 20%, um, especially if you're single with no children, no, no spouse or anything to worry about right now. There's so much more that you can do with your income besides purchase red bottoms or, you know, spend everything um, in subscriptions and just buying up stuff that you really don't need. You know, uh, I, I'm not quite there yet as far as like a minimalist, but I do find that buying um, just black t-shirts make it very easy and convenient for me. Um, just buying the same brand of jeans and having like 10 or 15 pair of those jeans make it very easy to decide what you're going to wear every day versus wasting time looking in the closet, struggling. And is this the latest fashion? Is this in style? Is this Vogue? Is it, you know, all of that extra you could really avoid. And if you're trying to build generational wealth, these kind of things can kind of hinder you. So I wanted to kind of give you guys um, a little bit of food for thought and why generational wealth is important. Um, if you're looking at starting from scratch, when you first start out, and I remember when I first got married, my wife talked with my daughter, she's 16 now about it recently, and she was saying how, you know, me and your father, basically, we were in love, we got married, we put our money together, we got our first apartment, we had one car, <laughs> okay? And um, I remember, it was her car, actually, and I remember, you know, when we went through the struggle, uh, that first year within marriage, um, I got laid off from Ford Motor Company. I was working at the Ford Motor Plant. Got laid off. It used to be in Hapeville, Georgia. Uh, not only did I get laid off, I lost my father uh, the same year I got married. So we had um, storm after storm hit us <laughs> to where, you know, we were like, wow, you know, this is, this is really tight. And my father did leave money for each of the children as well as my mother. And that money helped us to kind of guide through the rest of that period, you know, while we were in our honeymoon phase as newlyweds. I did, you know, secure another job. But I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to securing another job, before I found a company that I stayed with for 16 years, I went back to working for like Wendy's. Like I literally went from Ford Motor Company, which paid like 19, maybe 20 something an hour with cost of living and everything. So you're talking 20 something an hour, a union job at the Ford Motor Company plant, getting let go and having to work at uh, back at the beginning. I think I might might have been like an assistant manager, if even that, at a Wendy's. And it was very humbling. And people would look like, well, I can't 
bring myself down to that. But when you need to take care of business and you need to pay bills, you do what you have to do. You can always get a job up when you're at a job. It seems like it's hard to find a job when you don't have a job. So don't feel ashamed if you have to downsize temporarily just to get something higher. I didn't stay there at the Wendy's long. I basically worked there long enough to go to a job fair. And I ended up being offered a management position at Advance Auto Parts. And upon taking that position, I worked there until there was a conflict in my schedule as it pertains to my faith. And when I realized that that was going to be a problem for them to accommodate me as such, I then um, sought other employment and ended up working in loss prevention. And the company I went to next, I actually worked for like 16 years. So before I started my own business and leaving. So you can build up um, as you go. And that's going to be a solid work ethic to help you in trying to build generational wealth and grow. So again, if you're starting from scratch, you realize that there is a lot at stake. It's hard, especially if you went to college and now you have student loan debt over your head and you're trying to get certain jobs and certain jobs are looking at your credit and they're seeing that things are negative on your credit. Um, you're trying to get an apartment or somewhere and they're like, well, looking at what you owe and what you're making and do you have enough? So there's a lot at stake um, if you don't get a good start in life already. And many of us didn't get a good start. You know, we were just pretty much told, go to school, go to college, get a good job. And you go to college, you become a doctor and now you got like $300,000 in student debt student loan debt, if you don't get a scholarship or something, or if you didn't have money saved. So in these kind of cases, people are behind the eight ball starting out and credit cards and debt are, you know, they give you credit cards in college. It's like a way of life. Like, oh, just get a credit card because we know you're going to make money in the future because you're going to have that degree. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And you, you do this and now you find yourself deeper in the hole. So imagine, if you will, if your parents had the ability to fund your college to pay for your education. Imagine if there was some money set aside by your grandfather, your grandmother, that when you went to college, all debt would be paid equally and that you would walk out with zero debt and with the degree to get you that, that wonderful job that they've sold you and told you about. Then you can, instead of worrying about student loan debt, you could be saying everything I earn is going towards building my first home or maybe even getting a rental property or building towards your future retirement. So you see how you get a leg up when um, there is generational wealth or something to hand down. And if you continue in life, you realize that um, it's not always easy to recover from the financial mistakes that you've made. That $200 or $300 uh, outfit that you bought for that credit card company, when you miss the payments and you begin to goof off and things happen, maybe you got let go of the job or you didn't get that dream job. And now that $300 outfit has now cost you $1,200 when the credit card companies are through adding their interest and fees and they're leaving it on your credit for like seven years to try to hinder you. Um, you know, the bank and the money you owe them, all these things can happen in an instant. So you realize that, you know, it's difficult if you weren't educated financially, and if you don't have um, some type of inheritance or something to give. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people, I know you're out there saying, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I did it myself. Well, happy for you. You know, it's not impossible. You can learn um, the hard way. And some people do. Don't think just, oh, I'm going to win the lottery and I'm going to become a millionaire overnight. No, a lot of people um, that are first generation millionaires, they did have to come up with an original idea or they did have to try to come up with a business or service or good or product, something that others weren't doing to get there. So we're not going to negate the fact that these things can happen. However, it is much easier if you have um, a generational setup. And I, and I can't help but point to some of the, the, the different people that you see now. A lot of these people that we see parading around that may have even done better than their parents and made more money. They still were in a position already to get to that next level. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about the former president, for instance. Um, his father gave him like a million dollar loan starting out. So, of course, he was able to grow and, and become a real estate mogul if your father was already in real estate. You know, when you look at a situation um, where some of these people, I mean, even, you know, Warren Buffett, his father owned like a trading firm. It was a small brokerage or whatever, but he still had one to begin with. So him being an entrepreneur led Warren Buffett to invest in his first stock at 11 years old. 
And now he's the Oracle of Omaha. You know, he's done um, everything from Coca-Cola to all these great stocks and the Delta stocks and made all this money and become one of the richest men in the world. But he had a stepping stone, not to negate his prowess and his financial um, um, literacy, but you still had a, a leg up per se. I mean, even if we want to be ridiculous and say, okay, well, a Kardashian, uh, she would have never been able to be in a circle with like Michael Jackson's nephews and Ray J had her father not been OJ's lawyer. So you still came from money and in, in, in the vein of those who had money. And I kind of wanted to bring that out to help you to understand how important generational wealth is. And if you weren't born with a silver spoon, a copper spoon, a wooden spoon, no spoon, maybe you was born with, with, with just your nails in your hand. Make sure that you start to strive to leave for your children and your children's children. That's the point of this. Um, not to sing the blues about how bad we had it, but to leave it better for the next generation, to teach them how to balance a budget, to teach them how to balance a checkbook, to teach them how to pay their bills before they go and spend money on pleasure and vacations and fun. You know, to let them know that everything that they may see on social media um, isn't real. You know, a lot of these people are posting these vacation pics and these things, and you don't know what kind of um, different camera tricks and different things they worked out to get there. So we want to make sure that we're, we're building generational wealth the proper way. And leaving our children uh, a great legacy and our grandchildren. So the concept of building generational wealth, it sounds pretty easy. You know, I mean, you're like, well, Micah, it sounds easy. You're saying basically save money, invest, do these things. But we want to to kind of understand um, you, you have to not only acquire assets and save cash, um, you have to have um, teachings that you hand down to your children. You have to be able um, to express to them how to practice financial responsibility. You have to teach them delayed gratification that if you save your money and buy that item versus trying to get it through credit or other means and hurting yourself because now you're paying more or you're teaching yourself impulsive spending that as soon as I get a payday, I spend my whole check, you know, teaching them um, how to nail down that behavior of discipline as children is vital and we've experienced it, raising our children and teaching them. If they want something, we say, hey, listen, you work for half of the money and we'll pay you an allowance for the work you do. And if you make your quota and you don't spend it to a certain dollar amount, we'll put in and go with the other half. Or we negotiate a barter or help them to understand that it didn't come easy. And I expressed to them that I had to work a certain number of hours or days to make what I made to help you do what you do. So that they have an understanding that money doesn't just grow on trees. That, you know, it didn't just fall out the sky, but that we, we, we had to labor and work for it. So there are different things you can do to try to prepare to leave a legacy of wealth for your children and grandchildren. And some will say, well, how? I'm going to give you a couple of tips. And I'm not saying all of these are going to be um, easy. I'm not even saying all of these will be for you. Some may work, some may not. Um, but these are ones that have been proven over time. Uh, to work. So definitely seek what's best for you and your family. But one way is um, investments. And when you invest, you invest in um, this stock market. Now, stock, um, the stock market is a great way to build wealth. But um, also you have to have an understanding that there is a level of risk, a certain level of risk with the stock market. I tell people that um, it's not it's not good to invest in a stock market if you're not comfortable with what and with losing the investment that you put in it, if that makes sense to you. If it's going to pain you to lose $1,200 or $1,500 or $1,000 uh, or more, because some people have enough where they're like, huh, that's pennies. I could put $25,000 right now on a stock. Okay, if you have that kind of money, you know, happy for you. But the reality is you have to make sure you're in a place where you're comfortable. Uh, should it crash and you lose that money? Um, will you lose sleep? Are you going to be in need of that money a week later because you didn't pay certain things? So don't invest what you're not comfortable losing. That would be a piece of advice I'll give you for free. And it sounds scary if you never tried it, but it is an important way to build wealth. Um, even when you look at a 401k, a lot of them will invest um, in you know mutual funds or they'll invest in like the s p 500 you know those 500 companies they'll invest in these things safe you know for you you have like a Roth IRA you have different ways you could do it and I'm not an expert so I'm not gonna start telling you what stocks to pick and what to do but um you know 
if you go to like low cost index funds, they can offer like lower fees and long term growth and it can help you out. I was looking at I think it was the Motley Fool and they were saying recently that there was um, ways you can invest even your stimulus. And within, I think, 15 to 20 years, you can make uh, a good amount of money off of it. I think they said as far as even like 25 years. But at any rate, I know that at the end of it, if you could let that money sit for that long and put it in the type of accounts that they suggested, they were saying you would be able uh, to increase uh, a $1,200 stimulus check uh, into I think like around maybe between 25, 30,000 or better. Um, and even they were saying if you add it to it as it grows, um, you could actually end up with like two hundred and twenty something thousand dollars or three hundred something thousand dollars. So this this is just one way. But we will we we do know that the stock market is something that has worked in history. Uh, I was looking at the situation that went on. Um, many of you may have heard about with the GameStop and the situation with the AMC and the Robinhood app. And there was a mother that had invested sixty dollars in GameStop for her son. He liked to play games. He was a young man. And this mother gave $60 to her son for GameStop. And when the whole thing went down, the boy ended up walking away with like $3,200. So his her his mother's $60 investment grew, grew exponentially. Like that boy got $3,200 off of a $60 investment. Um, there was another gentleman that I heard that said he put like $5,000 into that stock and he walked away with like 47,000. So the stock market is um proven. It is a proven way to make money. I would recommend you go to like a Charles Schwab, you know, you could go to um, you know, um um, you know, one of these other brokerage far- firms, a professional. Um but if you do want to try it on your own, that's what the Robinhood app and those kind of apps are for. There are others out there that you could actually try if you want to, you know, Try your hand at the market and see how you do. But just remember that don't put anything in you're not comfortable losing because um, that can happen. And, and and make sure that you talk to a professional before you put your money up. You know, at least talk to one. Even if you're not going to go through one of those firms, talk to somebody, get an idea before you just start throwing money all over the place. All right. So another way to build generational wealth is to invest in real estate. Real estate is another major way to build wealth, believe it or not. Um, There's a potential for steady cash flow. Um, There is increasing values over time because, you know, the housing market goes up and down as it goes up. And real estate could be a reliable path to wealth. You also have an idea of renting. If you're able to get into real estate, you can become a renter to other people. And when you're renting to people, um, you're able to make money. Uh, Now, the thing with the rental is, yes, you are responsible for repairs because now you are their landlord. So if the water um, pipe busts and it's not the city's job to fix it, but the homeowners, yes, you have to fix that. If it's a situation where the refrigerator or the oven or the washer and dryer, whatever you supplied in the home that you're renting, if those go out, you know, depending on your state and your laws and what's going on, you will be held responsible is, and you don't want to be a slumlord where people are suing you and taking you to court. So with that being said, um, that is a proven market through renting the real estate. Um, you have people that flip houses. Uh, there were some brothers I know in Atlanta that flip houses and they post videos regularly and they talk about some of the things that they do in that industry. So I, uh, that is something maybe I could bring them on. We could talk about the real estate game, how you're able to do that and build an empire. And if you continue to buy properties one at a time throughout your life, you'll be surprised how quickly your real estate portfolio can grow. There's even companies where um, you can have people uh, manage for you. Their companies are saying, hey, we will manage your properties for you. If you buy them and you own them, we'll get you a property manager. Now, they will take a major cut of your rent. But to show you how this works, um, even in my neighborhood, the average home buyer may have bought their house. If you bought it, let's say 16, 17 years ago, um, your mortgage is probably like around between seven, 800, maybe 900, depending on the size of your home or your lot. Um, if you look at my parents when they bought their home, which was way back, like in the 90s, their rent was around like 500, you know, on a 30 year fix. Um, so those recently, like I said, you might be paying between seven and 900 on a 30 year fix. The rent in the areas for that same property will be like 11, 12, 1300 dollars or more. You know, I talked to somebody tonight and they were discussing how 
um, the rent, they may be charging like $1,600, depending on what side of town you're on, you know. So the rental game um, is something um, as far as real estate that can help you. You also have people that flip houses, you know, they pay for foreclosed or houses that are tore up a little bit. They put a little elbow grease and fix it up. And now the property value goes up. I saw that happen recently. There was a home that sold, I believe, for around um, a lower figure. Um, it wasn't even 100000 And this home now is valued and on the market for like 200 something thousand. So they've more than doubled their money. So this is um, a, proven, a proven track record that you can use when it comes uh, to real estate. So consider that. Um, another way to build wealth for your children and your children's children is to build a business that you can pass down. Family businesses, um, man, you talking about potential? I mean, family businesses can really do great things. Uh, most of the entrepreneurs that you see out there, uh, many of them either started their own business or, 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 or their, um, the franchise came through family and others, but you have a lot of second generation business owners and third generation business owners. Now the third generation is a little tricky. You know, a lot of times they have issues when you talk about third generation, uh, according to this report, is that more than 30% of family owned businesses transition to the second generation. So you're handing over your business to your children and not all make it that far. And like I said, usually by the third generation, a lot of those children uh, may squander the money because they don't understand the business. They don't have the same um, commitment to it as granddad and dad did because granddad put his sweat equity in to start it. Dad put his work in because he wanted to make granddad proud and didn't want it to fail. And he wanted it to succeed and to honor the family name. And now grandson is like, this don't mean nothing to me. We got more than enough money and this major corporation wants to buy us out. Why don't we just sell it for a big payday? And that happens, but you want to try to insist that the family keeps it in their generations and holds on to it. The company I told you guys I worked for for 16 years was over 150 years old and it was named after their last name and sons. So there are ways you can leave um, a lasting legacy for your children and your children's children if you're able to build that way, and if the children are able to take over the business you build. Another thing you could do is to possibly um, have it set up to where the business has to remain owned by a percentage of the family, so that even if your grandchildren decide to sell off shares or to get rid of parts of the business, at least you know some of it will always give residual income to your bloodline. That would be a wonderful way uh, to build generational wealth for your family and to have a greater chance, um, as far as having a transition it's best to include the children at a young age and let them experience the benefits, how the business operates, um, how to successfully continue the business if you're not there and, and to give them the understanding of the value of working in a family based company versus working for somebody else, uh, can kind of brutal. When in the workforce, you can get fired. Some people might need to experience that so that they can recognize the benefit of having a family business. I've met a couple of young men who went to college and their fathers started businesses and they didn't want to do the business their father started. Maybe they want to be a rapper or something else. And eventually when they went out in the real world and worked a job and, you know, got yelled at by a boss and got treated kind of unfairly and saw the favoritism in the workplace, they realized, man, there's no place like home. And they went back to their parent and ended up working for them. So, you know, I've heard stories like that. And then there's other stories where the kids say, you know, it just wasn't for me. My dad, he really wanted to start that oil company or that trucking business. But I'm just not a driver. I, I find it boring. I don't like the highway. So I'm not going to continue the legacy. I'm just going to do my own thing. And if you recognize that, don't expect them to take interest if they don't have an interest. Let them kind of create their own path and navigate their way. But if there are those that are willing, make sure you kind of teach them or help them so that they can have all the tools needed to carry on your legacy when you're gone. Another way to build generational wealth and help your children is to take advantage of life insurance. Um, never underestimate a life insurance policy. A life insurance policy can be a great windfall but it could also be a tragedy and a hindrance if you didn't prepare your children for it. Uh, case in point, I know a situation where, you know, a lot of money was left to a relative 
And what they did is they pretty much bought cars and just spent it how they wanted to spend it. And they didn't invest any of it. They didn't like put away or have where they put their money to work, where their money earned money for them. Because that's another thing that you could teach to help your children with generational wealth. Don't just work for money. Let your money go work for you. But unfortunately, that lesson's not taught a lot. So life insurance, you know, when they're given this big lump sum, you need to make sure that they're financially literate and educated to know what to do with that money so that they don't just spend it frivolously and become a good time Charlie and have all this great fun and end up broke. If you make an effort to invest in the life insurance, um, it can prevent financial tragedy for your children in the future. And if they know enough on how to deal with the money, they'll be able to cope when you're gone. They'll know that, okay, dad's funeral, mom's funeral is paid for. The plot is already paid for. And we're not scrambling trying to do a GoFundMe, um, which, you know, I know things happen. People don't prepare. So that's why on this show, we're trying to educate you so that you won't have to go to such extreme measures. But we do need to make sure we take advantage of life insurance policies. Um, you know, take care of your health. We do a segment. Your health is your wealth. Take care of your body so that you'll be able to get the best rates for your life insurance policy. And you can leave your children a nice nest egg. Now, another way to build generational wealth is to invest in your children's education. Make sure that you do whatever you can to help your child's education. The average um, student loan debt right now for a college graduate is around thirty seven thousand one hundred and seventy two dollars. But there are people that owe way more. People who get a bachelor's may owe fifty, sixty thousand dollars. People who get their master's even more. And you can lift that burden off of your children's back by putting money away. There are even like how you have your 401k. There's even one where you could put away for your child's education and they can add to it. So that by the time your child is ready to graduate or, or and go to college, they now have this money set aside and that money is only for school. You know what I mean? There are other ways you could save for their future. You could have money set aside in a bank account with compound interest when they're born and just add a little bit here and there and the compound interest will grow. So by the time they're 18 and legal, you know, they'll have enough to either invest in a business, go to school, get their home, get their car, you know, those kind of things. So you want to try to make sure you're taking care of your children and your children's children. And when you have that education, um, not saying the degree is the only way to make it. There are people who don't have the education of paper on the wall and they do great. But um, it does help depending on the job field you're going for in this society. So investing in your child's education is really a good way to help build generational wealth and help them out. Another way is to teach your children about personal finance. It's estimated that 70% of families lose their wealth in the second generation and 90% lose it in their third. And I told you that third generation is usually the ones that lose interest and they move on. So you need to make sure that you teach your children personal finance literacy. I mentioned earlier about um, delayed gratification. Study these principles and help your children so that you can build assets and pass on generational wealth to the next generation and help their life um, become easier. You can write out an estate plan so that they can understand how an estate works. And you can tell them what your goals are, what your assets are, and get you a legal professional so that they can help you craft the documents that you need to develop an estate plan for what you want to do. Write out a will so that you know exactly where your money is going and who's going to receive it when you die. Because unfortunately, you have a lot of situations where wills weren't put in place and siblings and family get to fighting and lawsuits get to flying and lawyers get involved. And before long, they dilute whatever you were going to give the family. They water it down and break it down and pay themselves so many fees to where, you know, they're left with chicken feed. They don't have that much left. So make sure that you write a will and that you keep it updated um, should you your wishes change because things can get really ugly with family if you don't have a will. Um, set up custodial accounts. So that's going to help your children. Is investment accounts that can help you for your children until they're no longer minors. That is a good way. Make sure that you name beneficiaries for your bank accounts so that when you die, the beneficiary will be able to have access to your funds. And I wanted to kind of help you um, in that. That plan I mentioned earlier about your children's education is called a 529 plan, by the way. 
Um, it's a tax advantage savings account that's tied to paying for your children's educational costs. They're also state sponsored and they help you to save money for your children's future. So do that 529 plan if you're trying to save for your children's college. Um, again, though, you want to get a will. You want to have all those things in place so that people are not confused as to what your wishes are when you die or where your money should go. And this is vital and important because um, things get ugly. Things really get ugly when you pass. So I wanted you to understand that building wealth to last for your generations, um, it may not be an easy task to do. It may come with a certain level of anxiety or difficulty at the thought of it. But if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to vigilantly dig deep and say, I want to fulfill the scripture earlier that, uh, that I'm going to leave uh, an inheritance for my children and my children's children. You could do it. It's, it's possible. And you want to safeguard your family's future at any cost. You want to make sure that they're well taken care of when you leave this earth. So take time to implement your wealth building strategy. You know, try to make sure that you do what you need to do. Everybody may not do real estate. Everybody may not build a business. Everybody may not like some of the things that I've said today. But start to educate yourself on how to save and put away money. And um, that way you can be a blessing to your children. And I know some are going to say, well, can I just hide it under a mattress? Um, what you have to remember is money is constantly moving. Um, we don't believe that you should love it. The love of money is the root of all evil. According to scripture, don't love it. But you should be able to have um, an understanding of it, that money is a tool, that it is used uh, to pay debt or to you know increase um, the different things that you need around your house. And to take care of your family with it. It's a promissory note, basically a bunch of green paper. But you want to um, exercise caution when you get involved with these different financial markets and things. You want to make sure that you've done your due diligence and educated yourself so that you won't you can avoid a pitfall and avoid um, losing everything. All right, so this is Micah Dobbins, host of the Micah Dobbins Show, powered by Misfits of Media. I hope you guys enjoyed this show as we talked about ways of building generational wealth and income. Make sure you stay tuned as we continue to bring you very informative and other topics and interviews as well. Uh, I'm actually running a campaign right now. If you haven't signed up for my monthly newsletter, please visit www.themicahdobbinshow.com and you'll get a chance to enter in as you sign for my newsletter with your email address. You enter in for a chance in the drawing to win a $50 gift card that we're going to be announcing on the 15th um, starting next month. So make sure that you guys are able to, uh, to check that out. I also have a couple of awesome interviews coming up really soon. I'm excited. Some entrepreneurs that I'm going to have in the mix. I'm also going to have some educators and other people in the mix. So make sure you guys stay tuned in to us because there's a lot of things going on right now. Really good at the Micah Dobbins show. We're really excited about it. You can also visit my store on my website and you can purchase some items if you want to help to support the show. You can also join my Patreon. You can check me out on Anchor FM as well as other podcast platforms. The Micah Dobbins Show is the name. Spotify has it. You know, Google Pods has it. So you guys can check all of those out as well as various social media. If you want to find me on Instagram, you want to find me on Facebook, you want to find me on Twitter, The Micah Dobbins Show, we're there. So make sure that you like, share, subscribe, follow, hit the notification bell if you go to YouTube. And until next time, guys, this is Micah signing off.